Hey there, film enthusiasts, and welcome to my cinematic exploration corner. In this segment, I'll be delving into the lives and careers of three iconic directors who share more than just their heritage. Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, and Michael Cimino were three filmmakers who rose to fame during a period that nurtured risks and innovation, only to face a colossal failure that forced them to reposition themselves in an industry that had changed completely. This first episode focuses on Francis Ford Coppola's meteoric rise to fame in One from the Heart, the project that changed everything. So grab your popcorn, settle in, and join me as I explore the stories and trajectories of three directors who face the highs and lows of an industry, and constantly showcase the grit and determination that defines true cinematic visionaries. In the late 1960s, a seismic shift rattled the foundations of Hollywood, giving rise to a cinematic movement that would forever redefine the landscape of American film. This transformative period, often referred to as New Hollywood, spent roughly from 1967 to 1982 and marked a departure from the conventions that have long characterized the industry. The decline of the traditional studio system, where studios had substantial control over the production, distribution and exhibition of films, the rise of the tumultuous spirit of the countercultural movement, and the legal challenges to film censorship that resulted in the dismantling of the Hays Code, which for the previous 30 years had governed cinematic content, opened doors to a new generation of filmmakers, influenced by both European and Japanese cinema, to create something different. During this period dominated by filmmaker autonomy, innovative storytelling and social realism, prominent names like Arthur Penn, Peter Bogdanovich, Mike Nichols, William Friedkin and Francis Ford Coppola rose to fame. Francis Ford Coppola's career started immediately after he graduated with his master's in film production at UCLA. Like so many other influential filmmakers, he got his first break after enrolling in the Roger Corman School of Cinema. Corman was known for his rapid and cost-effective production methods. He often worked with modest budgets and tight shooting schedules, pushing filmmakers to be resourceful and efficient in their craft. Corbin's films often delve into controversial and socially relevant themes, including issues of race, class and politics. This willingness to address taboo subjects and challenge societal norms set a precedent for the more daring and socially conscious storytelling that emerged in the New Hollywood era. Even before Francis Ford Coppola became a household name, he displayed an ambitious and visionary spirit. In a way, the director was a real entrepreneur, long before the term became a buzzword. In 1969, together with the then unknown George Lucas, the Italian-American filmmaker founded American Zoetrope, the first of two major studio ventures he'd been involved in. The production house emerged from the desire of both directors to create a collaborative and artist-friendly environment that departed from the traditional studio system. Coppola and Lucas envisioned a creative haven that would prioritize artistic freedom over the commercial constraints imposed by the majors. 1969 was also the year in which Coppola experienced his first taste of critical success with his road movie slash drama The Rain People. The title would mark his first collaboration with Robert Duvall and James Caan and truly captured the ethos of both the new Hollywood spirit in the 1960s countercultural movement. But directing The Rain People wasn't a smooth journey, with the production going over budget, a recurring scenario throughout Coppola's career. The entry would end up performing poorly at the box office. 
But the director's rise to the top got a significant boost in the following year, as accolades started to pour in thanks to the original script he penned for Franklin J. Schaffner's Patton, a job that earned him his first Academy Award. Coppola's biggest break came soon after, when he was selected to helm the adaptation of Mario Puzo's novel, The Godfather. The director was selected not only because of his Italian ancestry, but also because he would work for a low wage and budget after the poor commercial performance of the Rain People. And the rest, as they say, is history. Immediately after the success of The Godfather, Coppola continued to nurture his entrepreneurial spirit when he joined fellow Academy Award winner William Friedkin and the Last Picture Show director Peter Bogdanovich in late 1972 to found The Director's Company, a subdivision of Paramount. The venture was short-lived and ended just two years later after Peter Bogdanovich's Daisy Miller bombed at the box office. Throughout a seven-year span, from 1972 to 1979, Francis Ford Coppola was responsible for helming four of the best movies ever made. In the process, he developed a unique style and honed in on his mission to be an innovative filmmaker. Some of the traits, often associated with his work, include the ability to helm epic and ambitious narratives that span across generations, often exploring complex themes such as power, morality, and the human condition, as displayed in The Godfather, and its sequel, The Godfather Part II. Other traits include a penchant for poetic and visually striking aesthetics, and the use of experimental narrative structures, constantly displayed in titles such as Apocalypse Now. Finally, there's the use of symbolism, atmospheric lighting, and evocative cinematography, which is evident in titles such as The Conversation. All four films stand as a testament to the director's willingness to push boundaries and challenge conventional filmmaking norms. This period brought unparalleled critical acclaim and praise to the director. The four titles he directed during the decade earned him five Golden Globes, two Palme d'Or, the BAFTA Award for Best Director, and an additional four Academy Awards in the writing, producing and directing categories but it also highlighted some of the problems with Coppola's modus operandi. His meticulous attention to detail, penchant for perfectionism and reported indecisiveness resulted in all four titles going over budget and often running behind on the shooting schedule. This became obvious during the infamous three-year shooting plus post-production timeframe of Apocalypse Now. Due to budget overruns, Coppola reportedly invested a substantial amount of his own money to complete the film. This resulted in a tremendous financial strain and a personal toll on the director's health. But all the misgivings studio executives and producers might have about Coppola would always clear out, and soon he became known as someone who would always deliver. It might take more money and a bit more time, but the end product was always astounding. Coppola could do no wrong. Coppola's entrepreneurial nature wasn't limited to starting production companies. He was always a strong adept of technology and how it could be used to innovate the art of filmmaking. He saw technology as a tool at the director's disposal, something to assist artists to push the boundaries of visual medium and not as a replacement for talent. The director firmly believed that vision and story were at the front and center of the entertainment industry, as showcased by his unmade projects. One project that perfectly captures the artist's vision is the unmade Elective Affinities. Coppola imagined a movie that covered a 10-year period set in both Japan and America, combining Eastern and Western influences and heavily inspired by Kabuki theater. Coppola began developing the project, even laying out plans to construct a 2,000-seat theater in the Rocky Mountains for the first showing as a weekend event. 
A resort hotel would also have been built underneath the theater so that guests could view any part of the movie again to rewatch a scene that was missed or misunderstood. But before he could undertake any new challenges, the director was dead set on recovering from the exhausting production of Apocalypse Now. Keen to keep working and creating, he opted for a small-scale romantic comedy titled One from the Heart. But when we talk about a visionary of the caliber of Francis Ford Coppola, we know that there's no such thing as a small-scale production. One from the Heart follows the lives of Hank, played by Frederick Forrest, and Franny, played by Terry Garr, a couple living in Las Vegas who have been together for five years and are now struggling in their relationship. On the 4th of July, Franny decides to break up with Hank after a heated argument. She goes out to clear her head and have some fun, while Hank decides to drown his sorrows in alcohol and ends up meeting and falling for a young woman named Layla played by Natasha Kinski. Meanwhile, Franny meets a lounge pianist named Ray, played by Raul Julia, and sparks fly between them. As they spend time together exploring the city, they realize they have a strong connection and fall in love. A movie with this plot could have easily been made with two million dollars, but Coppola envisioned a modern take on love and relationships. That meant one from the heart would have to be different from anything audiences had seen before. Deciding on a live cinema feel with a certain artificiality angle to storytelling, the filmmaker opted to build every single set, which included a replica of part of Las Vegas McCarran Airport, as opposed to filming on location. Coppola, forever the pioneer, also used the latest technology available to bring his vision to life. The film's production used state-of-the-art cameras and other technical novelties, including innovative use of video editing and live editing of the soundtrack during filming. But all this innovation had a cost. What started as a $2 million production escalated into a $15 million movie, with the end product carrying a whopping $23 million price tag. The movie was ultimately a box office bomb with a capital B, generating little over $600,000 at the box office and forcing Coppola to declare bankruptcy. But box office performance aside, what's the final verdict on One from the Heart? A rare combination of style and substance, One from the Heart remains an underrated gem. Attractive, fascinating and true to the author's vision and desire to deliver something you have never seen before. With a stellar soundtrack, fantastic sets and a superb casting choice for the leads, played by Frederick Forrest and Terry Garr, Coppola managed to elevate the mundane into something extraordinary, and that's no small feat. In a way, One from the Heart became a decisive chapter in Coppola's career. There's the pre-hard Coppola, featuring a director who was a prisoner of his own success and felt the need to top himself with every new movie he made, and a post-hard Coppola, starring a director free from the pressure of the reputation he had earned during the 1970s. The filmmaker had invested millions of his own money in an attempt to complete the 1982 fiasco, and after filing for bankruptcy, he knew he had to get back on the saddle and make up for it. Coppola's failure wasn't an isolated event. Most of the creative powerhouses that became household names during the iconic New Hollywood period were finding it difficult to connect with audiences the way they once did. William Friedkin directed two back-to-back -back commercial flops, 1977's Sorcerer and 1980's Cruising. Peter Bogdanovich couldn't get a major studio to back his projects, and Mike Nichols hadn't directed a full feature release since 1975. But the most glaring outcome of One From The Heart's fiasco was around the nature or content of the films these directors would focus on. With the exception of Warren Beatty's 91 release, Reds, a minor box office hit, audiences and studios weren't looking for extravagant, experimental epics. 
Times had changed and virtually limitless funds that were at the disposal of creative minds in the movie industry had been channeled to blockbusters and high concept titles. Coppola couldn't afford to finance his own projects, so he embarked on a director for hire journey, working non-stop and accepting any project that would come his way. And here's where the filmmaker's entrepreneurial spirit really came to light. He took the opportunity to explore and expand his style into different genres, turning a failure into the beginning of the most creative and prolific period of his career. But did he succeed? That's all for today. Join me next time for the second episode of the Italian American Trilogy and find out if and how director Francis Ford Coppola recovered from the major setback that was One from the Heart. Once again, thanks for watching.